Jean Schnepp here. Welcome to another Savvy Sightseer video vacation and the start of a new category. This series takes a look at some places many take for granted, our local parks. In all, there's at least 70,000 acres of recreational and wooded parkland spread across Long Island, from Queens to Montauk. Most people have a favorite, whether because it's the closest or it offers different activities they like. In these videos, we are going to dive deeper into some of the great parks and preserves Long Island has to offer. We'll look at their histories and find out why these particular pieces of land escaped development and became public places, and even how they came by their names. You will find that the parks each have a unique story to tell. We're going to start this new series with some of my favorite spots, from my childhood stomping ground at Alley Pond Park in Queens, just three miles from the Nassau border, to one in Nassau, and a few in Mid-Suffolk. You'll find out what makes each spot special. If you get inspired to check them out, always call the park first for current operating hours and restrictions, residency requirements, and whether there's a parking fee at the time, or even if they may offer special senior rates or exceptions. And of course, remember to pack a water bottle and tick spray. For now, you can skip the insect repellent, sit back and enjoy a romp through Long Island's parklands. When I was growing up in Queens Village, a typical jaunt in the summer would be a two mile hike to Alley Pond Park. No, we never knew it was two miles at that time. Those days were well before Google Maps let you know exactly what kind of a trek you were in for. On the way, we used part of the original old Vanderbilt Motor Parkway and traipsed along what possibly had once been a part of an old underground railroad trail. Around the turn of the 19th century, young William K. Vanderbilt Jr., heir to a railroad fortune and a pioneer race car driver, became irritated that Europe was the scene for professional car racers. He wanted to showcase American ingenuity and car making skills against the Europeans and so in 1904, he sponsored America's first international road race, the Vanderbilt Cup race, using about 30 miles of existing public roads in central Long Island. By 1906, spectators numbered in the quarter million, and it was no surprise when one got in the way and was killed. Rather than let the sport die, Vanderbilt decided to create his own roughly 40 mile police free road without speed limits for the exclusive use of automobiles. It was to stretch from Queens to Lake Ronkonkoma in Suffolk County. In 1908, his Long Island Motor Parkway, a toll road, opened and the cup races were back on. But so were accidents, and international race car driving on Long Island ended in 1910. Over time, free roads were developed and the money-losing old Vanderbilt Motor Parkway officially closed in 1938, with the rights of way turned over to the counties through which it ran. The Queen stretch became a greenway connecting two parts, Cunningham to the west and Alley Pond to the east. Of course, we didn't know all that back in the 1960s, just that it was a great path for kids going through the woods, past backyards and playgrounds, and over and under major roadways to walk along on an adventure away from urban streets. In a move to protect open spaces in 1929, New York City Parks acquired 330 acres of land surrounding a region called the Alley, a natural valley that was a route to Brooklyn and Manhattan in the 18th and 19th centuries. In 1935, a 26-acre park officially opened that included a bird sanctuary, tennis courts, bridal paths, and a nature trail, the first such trail in the city's park system. Title to the Vanderbilt Roadway was transferred to New York City Parks two years later and was converted to a two and a half mile bicycle path. Today, Alley Pond is the second largest public park in Queens with more than 655 acres. But at one point, it lost its namesake pond. Over the years, New York City Parks filled in much of the valley's marshlands to construct recreational facilities and roads, such as the Cross Island Parkway and Long Island Expressway. When the LIE was built in this area in the mid-1950s, Alley Pond was infilled to create a cloverleaf interchange between highways. In the 1960s, I sat with friends on a hill in the park and watched as roads were built and expanded. So I was happy to learn that that travesty was undone when the State Department of Transportation in 2000 initiated a $165 million reconstruction of the interchange. 
The five-year effort returned 12 acres of land to Alley Pond Park and restored the pond in its original location by dredging out 65,000 metric tons of earth and plant matter. The park contains the Queen's Giant, a so-called tulip poplar that is the l tallest carefully measured tree in New York City and possibly the oldest living thing in the New York metropolitan area. It was just a sapling in the 17th century when the Dutch West India Company sent it as a gift to a group of Walloon families in what was then called New Amsterdam. Today, it is nearly 134 feet tall and is only considered middle-aged at about 400 years old. These trees can go on for 600 years. In addition to oodles of options for family fun, tennis courts, baseball fields, and multiple playgrounds, Alley Pond also has great spaces for family barbecues and fires in the typical stone hearths of New York parks. In 2007, the park got a new addition, an adventure course for outdoor team building and individual challenge activities for people of all different abilities and fitness levels. Components include a climbing and bouldering wall, a zip line, a trust fall station, swings, ropes, nets, leaps, and balance platforms. The Alley Pond Park Adventure Course was the first challenge course in New York City and the largest in the metropolitan region. According to park officials, it was also considered the most state-of-the-art course of this type in the United States. With so many options, Alley Pond is definitely an all-day excursion destination. When I moved to Nassau, I found a new go-to park for summer wanders. This time, no, we didn't walk the nearly four miles east to it. Instead, my friends and I would bike our way to Christopher Morley Park, a 98-acre patch of land filled with all sorts of recreational opportunities in Roslyn near the North Shore. For the sports-minded, there's a one-mile fitness trail loop and tennis, basketball, and volleyball courts, along with baseball fields, an Olympic-sized pool, and even an outdoor ice skating rink and a golf course. My favorite was always the acres of wooded nature trails. In 1961, Nassau County paid less than a million dollars for the property, previously an estate owned by John and Nettie Ryan, whose banking and mining interests made them a very wealthy couple, the elite of New York City high society. In the early 1900s, the couple had bought the Roslyn property with its Georgian Revival mansion shown in this archived photo as a country estate, which they christened Derrymore. In 1937, the mansion burned down and was demolished a few years later. Initially, when the county's plans to convert the property to a public park were finalized in 1962, it was to be called Ryan Park in honor of the couple. But then two bits of local history converged. Efforts had been underway to preserve a nearby one-room cabin that had been built by author Christopher Morley as a retreat on his Roslyn estate, where he wrote, among many other works, the 1939 bestseller Kitty Foyle. However, the estate's new owner didn't want the old cabin, dubbed the Knothole, so the preservation group needed a place to, to move it to. The county agreed to host it in its new park and dedicated the Knothole as a museum to the great writer who was buried in the nearby Roslyn Cemetery. To go one better, they decided to rename the park in his honor, a reflection of his contribution and service to Roslyn history. With the Knothole as its principal attraction of the park, Christopher Morley became open to the public in early 1965. The Latin quote on the cabin's eve attests to Morley's love of literature and equates the library to a place of paradise. Morley liked to cram his built-in shelves with not only his own books, but those of his favorite authors as well. He would compose his many works on a typewriter in front of a cozy fireplace. There was even a bunk bed for napping. But according to park officials, it was the cabin's bathroom that most intrigued his visitors. Designed by his friend Buckminster Fuller in 1936, the so-called Dymaxion facility, a one-piece pre-assembled unit, is similar to the bathrooms used on airplanes. Why this would have been a source of interest to anyone escapes me. More likely as a point of interest is the four-sided clock tower, finished in 1966 with four 185-pound clocks. It is one of the park's most recognizable landmarks and a convenient spot for people to meet at. 
On one side, it fronts the massive outdoor pool complex. On the other, it overlooks an 80 by 200 foot multi-purpose rink, where throughout the winter, skaters can enjoy afternoon and sometimes evening glides around the oval. Another feature of the park is its nine hole golf course, which I played a few times with my parents who were avid golfers. We soon discovered, however, that I am not, and that was the end of my days on the links. With all this and plenty of seasonal activities, like outdoor concerts offered during the summer, Christopher Morley should be checked out by lovers of the outdoors and history alike. Many drivers see the off-ramp for the Connecticut River State Park Preserve on the north side of Sunrise Highway, or Route 27, in Oakdale, but pay it little attention as they whiz on by heading west toward Manhattan. They have no idea that past the little guardhouse at the entrance are 3,743 acres of prime Suffolk County parkland that had once been the playground of extremely rich city sportsmen. Today, the park is overseen by the New York State Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation Department, which maintains easy walking trails as well as fishing on the Connecticut River. Detailed trail maps are provided free at the main entrance and various spots around the park. The Connecticut River was named by its first residents, the Secatog people, and translates to the Long or Great River. The Six Mile Waterway, one of Long Island's longest rivers, runs through the heart of the preserve and had been the main draw for those wealthy sportsmen. One of their most welcome sites was a simple mile marker. Way back, the road that ran from New York City to Montauk was called South Country Road, and when visitors reached this point, they knew they had arrived. Many would have taken the Long Island Railroad to near today's Central Islip stop, and then a horse-drawn coach to the grounds for a weekend of fishing and hunting. They'd stay at the Snedecor Inn, a very popular stagecoach stop that was run by Eliphalet, or Liffey Snedecor, on the land he'd leased from the Nickel family in the early 1820s. With Liffey's skills as a hunter, fisher, and innkeeper, and his wife's culinary renown, the inn morphed from a stopover on the way to Montauk to a destination itself. The land and inn were bought in 1860 by a group of the inn's longtime sportsman visitors, who then sold it for one dollar to the Southside Sportsman's Club that they'd incorporated in 1866. See if you can envision some of the more famous guests here. Ulysses S. Grant, W.K. Vanderbilt, Andrew Carnegie. Maybe they were sitting on the porch or heading into the men's only dining hall or lounging in the billiard room by the Franklin stove that had been a gift in 1886 from the proprietor of the old Astor House Hotel in New York City. The elegant arched stained window over the main doorway is nothing less than Tiffany glass. And yes, Louis C. Tiffany, <laughs> the C stood for comfort, really, was a club member. The roughly 100 founding members, who were indeed the elite of New York City, each paid $500 for 100 shares of stock in 1866. They came from all walks of industry. Some were bankers and financiers, others merchants, lawyers, horse breeders, publishers, restaurateurs, shipping, even members of government and the military. Equally impressive were their guests, who included Grover Cleveland, Teddy Roosevelt, and Dwight D. Eisenhower. Buildings were extended and added to the property. Like the housing annex, built in 1899 with a commanding view of the main pond. Accolades for the parkland include being billed as having, quote, superb hunting and fishing. The wealth of various breeds of fish, ducks, plovers, rabbit, quail, pheasant, and deer is what drew the privileged sportsmen out from the city. Also on the edge of the pond is a wheat and corn mill built in the 1750s. It once faced the Old, old South Country Road. When that road needed to be expanded as travel grew, a deal was made to redirect that main New York City to East End thoroughfare south of the preserve to what is now Montauk Highway, so the sportsman's playground wouldn't be bothered by increasing traffic through it. Just past the mill are street poles still marking the intersection of Old South Country and Brook Roads. The nickel mill operated until 1870 and was unique in that it used a horizontal wheel instead of the more typical vertical, 
reportedly a more economic design because it cost less and was easier to maintain. Tours of several of these buildings are available. Beyond the housing and mill complex lie 50 miles of horseback riding, nature, and hiking trails. Some of these are well marked and range from one mile in length to eight. Over 200 bird species, 300 plant species, and wildlife that includes reptiles, amphibians, butterflies, red fox, white-tailed deer, call this place home. In short, all creatures great and small. Along the way, there's an artesian well and a fish hatchery. Benches strategically positioned give visitors a chance to rest and absorb the various pond and river views. Well-placed signs detail the natural cycle of these woods and plants and how the well and the hatchery operate. The Friends of Kinequat even offer a free cell phone activated walking tour that provides additional interesting facts about the park, its inhabitants, and history as you walk. Citing high taxes and expenses, the Southside Sportsman's Club dissolved and sold the land to New York State in 1963 for just over $6 million. But then some members reorganized as the Kinequat River Club and leased the property for another 10 years when the group finally disbanded for good. The complex was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. And in 1978, this stretch of the Kinequat River earned the distinction of becoming the first park preserve in New York State. Whether it's for fishing, hiking, even cross-country skiing and snowshoeing in the winter, or just communing with nature or revisiting a piece of Suffolk County history, the Kinequat River State Park Preserve is a spot to pin on your map. Another parkland that started out as private property, then became a private club, and is now available for the pleasure of all, is the Caleb Smith State Park Preserve. Much of the preserve's 543 acres are undeveloped, allowing visitors to explore its freshwater wetlands, ponds, streams, fields, and upland woods. Nestled in the heart of very busy Smithtown in Suffolk County, the preserve is a refuge for wildlife and its diverse habitats support a variety of trees, shrubs, wildflowers, and ferns. Visitors can relax and rejuvenate while hiking, fishing, and birding, cross-country skiing, or snowshoeing along its many trails. The park's namesake was an 18th century judge and state official, Caleb Smith. The property was first inhabited by Native American Nessaquaks, then granted to the Montaukett tribe, led by Sachem, or Chief, Wyandanche. The chief later gifted the land to Lion Gardner, an English settler who in turn transferred it to Richard Smith, after whom Smithtown is named. Eventually, the land passed through the family to Daniel, Richard's grandson. He and his son Caleb built a modest two-story house in 1751, which is still incorporated as the core of the estate house, despite many expansions and renovations around it. Ultimately, the estate was sold to the Brooklyn Rod and Gun Club in 1888, a group that was looking for more challenging hunting than a nearby monthly pigeon shoot in Brooklyn. They found plenty of fertile hunting land in Smithtown. They expanded the small manor house to a four-story, 44-room clubhouse for its members that included billiard, club, and reading rooms, as well as bedrooms. Next, they updated the club name to lose its Brooklyn association. They chose the Wyandanche Club, paying tribute to the chief, whose image holds a prominent place above a restored fireplace in the main house. During its operation, the Wyandanche Club expanded its holdings to more than 13,000 leased and owned acres, rich in game like quail and pheasants, which they propagated on the property. Land was eventually sold off, likely due to taxes and local property development, until New York State bought the clubhouse and a little more than 500 remaining acres in 1963. But again, it leased it back for 10 years to club members who reorganized at that point as the Nisiquag River Club. In 1974, the property was open to the public and in 78, it became a preserve. Parts of the building are open to the public and offer a variety of educational exhibits such as one that details Caleb Smith's conflicts with British soldiers during the 1770s. There's also a natural history exhibit, including taxidermies of a great blue heron, red fox, flying squirrel, 
and River Otter. A three-dimensional display of the preserve's property and landmarks explains the preserve's history. Some artifacts from the Sportsman's Club days are laid out, along with a piece of a gristmill stone that ground wheat and corn into flour. And then there's Caleb's door. It was an outer entryway on the original house, and it has a story to tell. Actually, there are several versions of the Caleb versus adversaries and how this door factored into it. Much speculation has arisen over the source of a gash in the wood. One tale has it that Caleb Smith, a strong patriot who had refused to take an oath of allegiance to King George, drew the ire of British soldiers stationed on the island. When they came for him, swords drawn, he reportedly slammed the door on them, catching the sword, which left a gash. Another story has it that he possibly ratted out a fellow patriot, who, when released finally from a British prison, came literally with daggers out to exact revenge on Caleb. It ends pretty much the same way as the other recollection, with the dagger being thrust into the door, leaving its mark. And a third version has marauders from Connecticut pillaging and ravaging farmers on the island. They set upon the smiths with cutlasses and robbed them of anything of value that Caleb hadn't already hidden in the woods. When they were finally done, Caleb flung the door shut behind the departing men and, yes, caught the blade in the process. Stretching out behind the house, in part, is the summer kitchen, where the family did all their cooking in a wood-burning fireplace. The house overlooks Willow Pond, which was constructed in 1795 by Caleb's son, Paul. He had raised the dam on Whitman Stream to power up the grist and sawmills they then built. Neither remain today, but they were integral to the family being able to provide for all their needs through their own property. In all, there were seven, nine homes, a tannery, a shoe market, two mills, and three mill ponds on the estate. Several trails crisscross the park, some a bit more rugged than others, and range out a little over, from a little over half a mile to two and a half miles long. Part of the Long Island Greenbelt Trail runs through the park. My first experience with the trails at Caleb Smith was as part of a Greenbelt hike. That's a group that hosts walks all around Long Island for anyone who wants to join in. The Greenbelt Trail is a nearly 32-mile course running all the way from Sunken Meadow Park on the north, following the Kinequa and Nisiquag Rivers and part of the Ronkonkoma Moraine, to Heckscher State Park on the south shore. The Caleb Smith two and a half mile portion of the Green Belt Trek is designated with white tree markings, as you can see on the tree opposite a gazebo, which was an Eagle Scout project that provides a picturesque stop overlooking the pond. If fly fishing is more your thing, you'll find what you're looking for along the Nisiquag. Part of the eight mile river flows through the park, south of Route 25. The park is stocked annually with about a thousand brown and rainbow trout. Striped bass, bluefish, flounder, eels, and porgies are among the many other species of fish there. At the Wine Dance Club, there had been two main annual events, one for shooting and the other for fishing. The Nisiquag was billed as a paradise for true anglers, and that holds true today. Clinics on basic casting techniques and equipment needs are held for teens, 16 and older. Junior anglers can also get in on the action, with a program offered through the Nisiquag Fly Fishing School operated at Willow Pond in the park. For bird watches, osprey, red-tailed hawks, and egrets can be spotted. Truly, there's a little something for everyone at Caleb Smith State Park Preserve to enjoy as the sounds of cars and trucks whizzing along Jericho Turnpike or Route 25 and horn blasts from the nearby trains of the Long Island Railroad fade into the distance, and it's the 1800s all over again. Tucked away in the very exclusive neighborhood of Nisiquag on Long Island's North Shore near St. James is the stunning David Weld Sanctuary. Blink and you will miss the tiny parking lot, a major drawback to visiting the preserve. On one hand, there's only six spots and a big sign says a seventh vehicle could be fined and towed away. On the other hand though, it means you will have the 125 acres largely to yourself. The Nature Conservancy, a global environmental nonprofit that operates the Suffolk County Sanctuary, provides online a three-mile trail map 
and detailed brochure about the different types of trees, geologic features, and local landmarks in the park. What I like most about this preserve is its diversity. There's something for every nature lover, from open meadows to canopy-like towering trees, and even a lookout across the Long Island Sound from atop a 50-foot bluff. The sanctuary is named for its last private owner, investor David Weld, who bought the land, as well as a home on Boney Lane, with his wife Mary in the 1960s. The Welds initially donated 42 acres to the Nature Conservancy. After her husband died in 1972, Mary, known as Molly to her friends, donated her remaining property and it, along with some acreage contributed by neighbors, comprised this lovely open space. The forest is populated by a range of trees, red cedars and maples, hickories, as well as black birch trees. The aroma and taste of birch sap is said to be similar to that of wintergreen and root beer and is used to flavor candy and chewing gum. One tree in the woods that really caught my eye was the tulip tree, which for some reason made me think of telephone poles. Of course, I had to find out why these grew so straight while all around the trees went in every direction. So I learned that this type of tulip tree can grow up to 150 feet tall, making them some of the tallest trees on Long Island. Because of their long, straight trunks, these rot-resistant trees were popular among shipbuilders for mass, and later they were used for, yes, telephone poles. Although its leaves resemble the shape of a tulip, the name actually comes from their flowers, typically blooming in May and June, that resemble the tulip flower. The scenery here is stunning. Along the path, you are teased with glimpses of the Long Island Sound, that swath of water about 20 miles across from here to Connecticut. There's an abandoned stream to walk along and beds of lush ferns in season. Then you come out of the woods and suddenly are right above the shore with a beautiful view. A memorial bench 50 feet above the beach provides a wonderful resting point to take in the Long Island Sound and Connecticut in the distance. Around the bench, you will notice bits of a concrete foundation of a cabin that once stood here. It had belonged to Cornelia Otis Skinner and her husband, Alden Blodgett. In the 1930s, they had bought 90 acres facing the Long Island Sound, as well as additional land and a large house reaching farther south to James Creek and the Nisiquag River. On the bluff, they built a small cottage called the Watchman's Cabin, in which Cornelia would be inspired by the views to write. She was multi-talented, an acclaimed author, producer, and actress on stage, radio, and screen. One of her first productions in 1931 was The Wives of Henry VIII, a one-woman show. Another was the 1952 staging of Paris 90, in which she played 14 different characters. She was born into the profession, you could say. Her father was a matinee idol and her mother an actress at the turn of the 20th century. For much of her adult life, Cornelia lived here on the North Shore with her husband, a one-time banker who later turned to managing her career. She was very active in the local community, doing fundraiser performances and being involved in civic activities. After Alden's death in 1964, she sold the property to the Wells and moved to New York City. The cabin was unfortunately destroyed by fire in 1987. A short path leads the way down to the shore, there's about 1,800 feet of beachfront and a number of enormous boulders scattered along the water's edge. Some of these boulders even made it into the woodland, like this magnificent erratic. That's the name for a massive boulder likely left behind by a moving glacier. I'm absolutely fascinated by what appears to be an equally huge but broken tree lying next to it, believed to be a red cedar. What comes to my mind is a piece of natural driftwood many times larger than one that would fit on your coffee table. A glacier is also responsible for a huge kettle hole on the property. A massive block of ice once lodged there. When the ice melted, a 60-foot deep pit was left in the sediment. Whether for the flora, fauna, geology, history, or just a walk with nature, the David Weld Sanctuary is definitely worth a visit. I like to end all of my programs with the words of Dr. Seuss. Sometimes you don't appreciate the moment until it becomes a memory. And I like to add to it to always remember to celebrate the moments and treasure the memories. 
I hope you've enjoyed this tour with me of some of my favorite parks. The island is rich with so many beautiful spots, many of which are more than just pretty. They have stories to tell. If I didn't visit your favorite one or a park you'd wondered about on this joint, keep an eye out for future editions of this series. If you have any questions about the program, email me or use the contact page on my website. I also invite you to visit my website to see any of my European destinations. When libraries are again offering in-person presentations, you can check my programs tab to see where I'll be. And of course, visit your library site for more video vacations by Savvy Sightseer. To close, I ask you to keep in mind, parks are great places any time of the year. And to remember the words of Charles Dickens, nature gives to every time and season some beauties of its own. And I hope you can get out to explore some of Long Island's own beauties.